Thanks for joining us. Today's guest spent three seasons with the Cubs from 2004 to 2006 and quickly became a fan and clubhouse favorite. Today we catch up with former Cubs pitcher, left-hander, Glendon Rush. Glendon, thank you for sitting down with us today. We really appreciate it. Welcome back. I mean, it's got to be special for you to come back to a city like this where you spent three years and walk across the stage at opening ceremonies. It's a, it's a big deal. It is, yeah. I think I've been back the last five years to the convention, and it's always great to see old teammates and friends and coaches. And the fans here are terrific, and they never forget you and always welcome you back. Um, we were talking about Ryan Dempster's late night show off camera a little bit, and you mentioned a couple years ago when you were on a story that you got into town early and headed up to Miller Park and did a little favor to Cubs fans. You visited the mound. Any truth to that? Uh, no truth to okay. that. Yeah, All it was right. kind of a joke. I, I, I was trying to get the fans fired up and <clears throat> try and take the Brewers out of it. I know they've been, uh, they've been battling the Brewers the last few years in the Central. Well, if you have time before you head home tomorrow, maybe you can cruise <laughs> yeah, up there yeah. and do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know you played in Kansas City and New York and San Diego, Milwaukee. You had really good success here with the Cubs. Um, what do you attribute that to? I mean, what, what, your comfort level here was, was really good. Yeah, you know, so much of it's confidence. I, I came off probably the worst year of my career in, in Milwaukee and then and ended up here in 04 and just being around a great team that, that was right to where they were in 2003, uh, all the way to the NLCS, mm -hmm. and then having Dusty as my manager and and still in confidence and going back out kind of rejuvenated my career a little bit. I was I was uh, at a point where it was a little bit of a crossroads. Was Larry Rothschild your pitching coach all three years here? He was. Awesome. Loved him. Um, one of the best in the game, and it shows. I mean, he's still around. He's still around, yeah, and everybody says that, that, that worked with him. What is it about him, his approach, just what, what jives well with, with, with you guys? I think he has the ability to, to tell the raw, you know, the truth to you and, and uh, make, sure, make sure you're held accountable for what you do and very well prepared as far as game plans go. And, and then, you know, he's another guy that instills that confidence in you when you go out there and so much of the game's mental. If you're if you're positive what you're doing and believe in yourself, it, it shows through. I've always been fascinated by that aspect of the game, the mental side. I mean, it's, it's a super long year. It's a grind. There's highs and lows every day, right? Nowadays, I feel like more so the mental side is given more attention than maybe it was even 25, 30 years ago. How do you guys deal with the mental approach to a six-month season that can be such a grind? You got to be prepared, and it takes time. I think over the course of a career, you can you can uh, kind of develop those skills more and more. And as I got older, I was better at it, um, understanding the highs and lows, and you know all the cliches, trying to stay in the middle. And mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the things now that the players deal with, obviously, is the social media grind. is is a completely different animal. And and I've I've told people I don't know if I could have handled uh, Chicago, New York, um, with you know Twitter and everything else and everybody being so critical of every move you make, it's, it's pretty difficult. It's, it's tough. Speaking of influences, Larry Rothschild, and you, you spent uh, time as teammates with some, some great pitchers who we discussed, and I'd like to talk about them too, one of them being Hall of Famer Greg Maddox. What's it like being around him and sharing a mound with a guy like that? I mean, that's got to be incredible. He was a huge um, help to my career. He really was. Uh, I had his brother. Mike, um, his first year as a major league pitching coach in Milwaukee. And so I spent a lot of time with Mike talking about Greg as well, and then was fortunate enough to be here uh, as a teammate with Greg for three years and part of, part of a season in San Diego as well. And he, you know what, he gave you small tips here and there, but they were so meaningful and, and helped you on, you know, maybe the way you were pitching, if you weren't pitching in enough or things like that that just, uh, you know, they ring, they ring true right away when you hear it from a guy like that. And watching him go about his business and his routine was second to none. That's what I was going to ask you. Is, is he a guy that is more vocal with wisdom, or is he someone that you kind of watch and pick things up from because he's such a first-class guy when he comes to worrying about his, his approach? I think you watch and, and watch his routine, watch his preparation, those types of things were – what you really see and, and uh, just in, enjoy being around. And, and like I said, when he gives you a tip, it's, it's something that he really believes in and he, and he doesn't do that often. Not to put you on the spot, but what's a, what's a Maddox story that would give us an idea of how in tune he is with the game and pitching and that shows off how 
how smart he was uh, of a pitcher. Uh, one that sticks out to me was uh, when we faced Milwaukee, uh, Russell Brannion was one of the hitters on that team, and Greg just threw him changeup after changeup after changeup, and that was his game plan. And he said, if I hang one, he'll probably hit it 450 feet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, out of the 12 or 13 changeups he threw him that game, he did hang one and he hit it out. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of uh, um, pitcher he was and how, how smart he was. And, and, I, and I remember also just him throwing pitches that he knew guys would pull foul in the stands or, or for a strike. And, you know, it's, it's, I mean, he was fun to watch. Um, Greg, obviously being one of the, the great teammates you had, you have other great pitchers and, and Cubs greats that you pitched with. If we could maybe run through a list and just give us your thoughts on, on guys like uh, Kerry Wood as a teammate, as a pitcher. Kerry is, uh, to me, probably one of my best friends in baseball and uh, after the game as well. And to, to see him come up uh, when I was in Kansas City to watch his 20 strikeout game on TV in the clubhouse and then to eventually be his teammate and, and you know, be kind of part of his friend, friend circle and mm -hmm. be with his family and everything else. I mean, he was so fun to watch. There was nobody more exciting to watch. And, and you see when, when we have the convention here, when they bring him out on the stage, he still gets probably the biggest ovation out of any <laughs> Cub ever. So uh, he was great. What about being around a guy like Carlos Zambrano? Zambrano was so fun to watch. And I love the fact of how much of a baseball player he was. Yeah. He wanted to hit. I mean, he, <laughs> he wanted to be in the field if you, if you let him, you know. And uh, a, a great Greg Maddox quote about Carlos Zambrano was he was the one guy that he thought every single time he went out there he might throw a no-hitter. And that, and that was how electric his stuff was and how much of a competitor he was. You want that mentality, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, that's crazy. It is. Uh, what about your buddy Ryan Dempster? Being around him. And Demp's one of the funniest guys, as, as everyone knows, that, that's seen him and been around. One of the funniest clubhouse guys in the game, but, but a true competitor as well. And, you know, I think we all had a great feel for each other where we could hold each other accountable, be hard on each other, but also have a lot of fun and, and, and doing it. And, you know, those guys were so, so much fun to be around. Demp was obviously a, a heck of a great pitcher, but there's something to be said for a guy like that who can lead a clubhouse and, and be a leader. I feel like that's not always talked about enough. I mean, numbers are one thing, but that's a guy you want around, right? You've got to have it. And I think, um, I think the teams that you see now in the newer generation of baseball that are, that are winning, they, they have those types of guys around. You've still got to have your veteran guys that can make the clubhouse a, you know, a good place, a good environment to win, um, which transitions into a guy like David Ross coming here. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a great fit, and he's going to be a tremendous manager. You had over 200 start, over 220 starts in your career. Uh, I think 120 some appearances out of the bullpen. You even had four saves. Those roles are so different, right? Starting rotation compared to the bullpen, but you had success in both. It's got to be a tough. It's a tough transition, is it not? It is. Yeah, I, I kind of started that here, really, in uh, those those years in 04 and 05 when when guys like Kerry or or uh, Matt Clement um, mm -hmm. prior, when they got hurt, I, I filled in. And, and my joke was always, since I grew up a Sonics fan, I was the Detlef Shrimp <laughs> of the rotation, right? The sixth man. Um, it's a great role. I think it kept me around longer in my career. But like a, like a good pinch hitter off the bench, it's a very tough role to fill, in my opinion. It is. It's, you become the guy in the bullpen that's the, um, when the phone rings, you could be in in the first inning, you could be in in the ninth inning, you could be in an extra inning. So you've always got to be ready. That's a it's a difficult task mentally to to be prepared from the first pitch on. And and physically, I mean, not knowing maybe one day to the next what role you would be used in, depending on the time of year or what year it was. How did your approach change? Did your pitch repertoire change if you were coming out of the pen? Did it you kind of try to keep things the same? Depends on the situation. It did change because, I, you know, when you're, when you're starting, you are kind of navigating your way through a lineup, hopefully three times or more. And um, your pitch repertoire does change. And I think the way you approach the lineup changes a little bit. When you come in out of the pen, it's that first guy is mm -hmm. ultra important, especially if you've got runners on base. So I think sometimes I became a little more fastball heavy out of the bullpen um, than, I, than I did uh, as a starter. But... It, it, it's different, but it's kind of fun that I got a chance to do all of it. You know, speaking of good guys in the clubhouse and players you want to have around, you talk to your old teammates, Curry Wood, Ryan Dempster, the list goes on. They say how great of a teammate you were. And to me, as a, as a, as a fan, that's got to be a, a tremendous honor. I mean, I think that 
speaks volumes about a player if they have former teammates saying, this guy was the best teammate. It does. It's a, it's a humbling statement. And I tell young guys all the time that, that that's part of what can help give you longevity in your career is, is being a good clubhouse guy, being a good teammate to where when other organizations hear about you, they, they'll sign you in a heartbeat. If, if there's a question one way or the other, if you're that type of guy, you're going you to have an opportunity in more places than you will not. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, if we could, about your time in New York with the Mets, um, a few aspects of it, playing for Bobby Valentine. He called you the grittiest player that ever played for him. That's a heck of a compliment, too. I mean, that, that's infectious, isn't it? If you're a gritty player, that rubs off on, on the rest of the ball club. It does. Uh, to, to get that compliment, especially as a young guy, I was a kid there. Um, I was still carrying the beer on the bus. Uh, <laughs> after like three years in the big leagues there, that's how young I was on that team. So Bobby V was great. He gave me a, a, an opportunity in spring training the, the first year I was there to make the club as the fifth starter, and I earned it. And we ended up being a World Series team that year, and I was a part of it, and ended up being in the bullpen in the playoffs. So And pitching very well out of the bullpen in the playoffs. Yeah, it went really well. It was uh, <clears throat> quite, a, quite a memory to look back on to have that opportunity and, and uh, be successful. We have a split city here, obviously, Cubs and White Sox, and there's a friendly hatred between fans, I guess. What was that like, a World Series between the two? I can't imagine that happening here. I think it would be nuts. The city of New York shut down, essentially, <laughs> when, the, when the that was going on. I was trying to explain that to my oldest son the other day about what it was really like to be Mets, Yankees, and the hatred for each other, not necessarily the players, but, but, the, but the city and the longtime fans. Um, they, were, they were out of control that year. And unfortunately, we, uh, you know, we didn't come out on top, but it was an incredible experience. Is that more of a fans thing, the, the, the hatred, or do you guys as players get amped up a little bit more? I mean, World Series is different, but just a, a regular interleague series, Cubs Sox, say, I mean, do you feel the juice is flowing a little more? Oh, or? there's no doubt. Yeah. yeah. Even, even the years I was here um, for Cubs Sox, I think because both teams are good, mm -hmm. there was some definite rivalry going on, and I think that's gone up and down over the years. But when I was here, I think it was at its height, you know. What was it like being in New York? Uh, as a player during 9-11 when that happened. Uh, that's permanent scars that are left on you, I'm sure. It is. It, it was a, uh, you know, you never forget uh, that experience and, and being there and being a part of it. It was <clears throat> heartbreaking to, to see what, what was going on. And, and uh, the, you know, the only silver lining of the whole situation was that we were there and, and helping mm -hmm. um, as players. We uh, Shea Stadium parking lot became ground zero for where they were bringing the first responders in and we were helping load supplies and you know we were off for I think over a week wow. before we came back and um, it was it was a somber somber time and and kind of tough to get through as a ball player to to say hey we have to go out and play baseball now and when, when people lost their lives and family members and it was tough. To that point I and maybe this is too simplistic of an approach I feel like sports was one of the main things that kind of brought us back together after you guys started to play again. Oh yeah, there's no doubt. You know, I watched, I love watching. I still get, you know, raises up the hair on your arms when you watch the, the game back at Shea and Piazza hitting the home run. Uh, um, all, the, all those stories are, are amazing and, and it was so nice to be a part of that. In 2006, I, I wasn't aware of this and maybe a lot of people don't know, you had a, a pretty major health scare. Um, take us through what happened and how that came about. We were coming off a road trip and I uh, went to Wrigley to do my normal workout and uh, having a little bit of chest pain. And as a ball player, you just go, oh, I'm fine, I'll, I'll get through it. And went in, started running on the treadmill. Mark Pryor was the only guy in the, in the weight room with me. And he looked over at me and he said, Rushy, you don't look very good. And I was, you know, stark pale white. And I said, I don't feel very good. And ended up going in and seeing the team dock and Long story short, I ended up uh, in the ER at Northwestern that night and had a pulmonary embolism, had a blood clot in my lung. Missed the rest of that season. I uh, was on blood thinners for a year. Uh, they, didn't think, they, they didn't think I would come back and play. I was, they thought that would be a lifelong um, issue that I'd have to be on blood thinners. And fortunately, 18 months later, I decided, they took me off blood thinners. I decided to come make a comeback. And, was able to make it back with the Padres and the Rockies and pitch again. Did they find that right away when you went in, or was it something that took a while to diagnose? They did not. I was the, the second case in the last 800 cases they had at Northwestern. 
um, where nothing sh uh, showed up on my blood work or on my chest x-ray. Very unusual. I actually went back and spoke at Northwestern um, with our with our team doc, Doc Adams, and uh, just because I was a rare case and yeah. spoke to a bunch of residents and, and everything about it, kind of my symptoms and what was going on. So it was uh, interesting that, that I ended up being one of those guys. And um, they... Uh, treated me great and and fortunately I'm back I haven't had any issues knock on wood I've been a healthy guy ever since that's phenomenal and Doc Adams and the Cubs medical staff urged you to look into this further after initial testing didn't show anything he did he actually called the ER at Northwestern mm -hmm. and said you guys are not sending him home they they thought I was clear and I was in a tremendous amount of pain on on uh, pain meds and they said no we got to get you know a CT scan and and that's eventually where they found it Baseball aside, that's got to change your approach to life in general after an episode like that. It did. You know, baseball was my life. So I, I think, you know, everything hits you and you spend a year watching all your buddies at home. I was still under contract for one more year here with Chicago, which I that was one thing. If, if there's anything I regret in baseball, the fact that I didn't get to stay here and play in 07 for Lou Pinella, uh, who I watched, <laughs> uh, you know, as a Mariners fan growing up, I would have loved to play a year for Lou, but just didn't work out. So after you retired, you got into coaching a little bit uh, with the Padres organization. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, how did that come about? That was uh, kind of another Cubs connection. Mark Pryor was hired as the pitching coordinator for the Padres. And uh, he called me and said, hey, I'd like to interview you, which was an interesting process when you have a buddy interview you. And But he did a good job. He was straight faced. And so I went, went down and interviewed with the Padres and they hired me since I was somewhat local in Southern California, I ended up uh, taking the Lake Elsinore job in the Cal League and did that for three years. And it was some of the best experiences I've had. I really enjoyed it. What was your favorite part about working with younger pitchers? <clears throat> Developing them and, and watching them grow. And I think helping them mentally and, and kind of teaching them how, how to be a pro and how to go about their business. And, you know, from a, from a mechanical standpoint and everything else, you can only change guys so much. And a lot of times you don't need to change them. Mm -hmm. You just need to kind of pat them on the butt and make them feel confident in what they do and say, hey, you're going to be okay. And, you know, two, three years from now, you're probably going to be a big leaguer to some of those guys. And a lot of them are now. To me, if I ever had a coach that, that played, especially in the big leagues like you, I mean, they, they have to respect what you say maybe a little more than the next guy. You've been there. You've done it. You've had success. I think that's a big key. You know, it's it's hard. I think there's a huge um, kind of struggle and balance now in baseball of taking taking front office guys and um, you know people that that are on the analytics side and mixing in that, them in with the coaching, and then you've got guys with older school guys with experience. And I was kind of in between, I think. So it was nice. I was pretty fresh out of playing and young enough to where guys felt really comfortable with me. And I, I spent a lot of time talking to guys. In fact, we have. I think three of my guys are, are now Cubs now, uh, Brad Wick, Colin Ray, and uh, Trevor McGill, who was just rule fived over here. I had all three of those guys in San Diego. That's great. What did you learn about the game, if anything, from that side, the coaching side, that maybe you didn't pay as much attention to or realize as much when you were pitching? I think some of the brutal reality when you start <laughs> sitting in the coach's room and you see um, all the magnetic boards up there with names on it and, and how they get shifted around, how they move throughout the organization, mm -hmm. how guys end up on the, on the bottom right, you know, on the possible release side, you know, a guy's career could be over. That, that stuff's tough to look at because, you know, you were, you were in that position at one point or probably multiple times in your career. You talked about your sons uh, a little bit off camera. They're into sports. You get more anxious watching them play or when you were in the big leagues pitching? Oh, it's hard. <laughs> it really is hard to watch them play because you want them to do so well. And, and I try my best not to put any extra pressure on them because their dad played in the big leagues. Yeah. You know, it's tough. It, I think more other parents put that pressure on the kids because it's like, oh, you know, Glennon, you know, Glennon played in the big leagues. So <laughs> Cade and Trevor are supposed to be all stars. Yeah. But, you know, they, I think they handle it really well, and it's really fun to watch them play. Can we do maybe a quick rapid fire to get to know some of your former Cubs teammates? If I throw out a, a name, you can give us a one or two word answer that something sure. comes to mind, something along those lines. Moise Salou. Competitor. How about uh, Aramis Ramirez? Silent assassin. <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, Michael Barrett. Fire plug. We talked a little bit about this guy off camera, but Dusty Baker. Leader. How about Greg Maddox? The 
the professor. And your buddy Ryan Dempster. Clown. <laughs> <laughs> Glendon, thank you so much for doing this. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. It. To see more of my interviews with former Chicago Cubs and other great Cubs content, be sure to subscribe to the Chicago Cubs YouTube page.